back uh, from lunch. Uh, we are, I'm really honored to uh, introduce uh, our MHS colleague, uh, Amy Harai, who is not only uh, chairing and moderating this panel, uh, but is also um, overseeing the whole uh, Twitter enterprise. Uh, people probably know that hashtag politics of health uh, is trending, or at least um, it's trending, right? It's trending, so that's, that's <laughs> All right, so. Hi, everyone. Great. Okay, I'm a short person and can't really speak to this mic, so I'm going to stand on my tiptoes. And um, I'm really excited to be here and to moderate this panel on intersectional research on the U.S. South. I'm going to introduce everyone um, before the panel starts uh, because we have quite a few presenters and um, they all have really exciting things to tell us. So, um, in order, uh, we have um, the Working Group on Race and Racism in Contemporary Biomedicine uh, will be sharing their work with us. Uh, Jennifer Singh, who's Assistant Professor of Sociology and History at Georgia Tech, will be speaking on their behalf. Um, but also here um, are Manu Plot, Ann Pollock, and one more person, right? Ryan Gibson. Ryan and Gibson Emily, and Emily Pingle. And Emily Pingle. And Emily Pingle. Thanks. Uh, and then next we have Laura Carpenter, who's Associate Professor of Sociology at Vanderbilt. <laughs> um, Michael Wright and Tanya Wright um, from the uh, School of Social Work and Urban Studies um, at uh, at, sorry, at TSU, and also, um, let's see, uh, Sarah Kugler, who is the co-director of the Anna Julia Cooper Center on Race, Gender, and Politics in the South at Wake Forest, uh, Gilbert Gonzalez, Assistant Professor of Health Policy at Vanderbilt, and then our respondent is Phyllis Shepherd, who is the Interim Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, and Associate Professor of Religion, Psychology, and Culture at the Vanderbilt Divinity School. So, um, welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, and uh, thank you, Jonathan uh, Metzel, and all the folks at the Center for uh, Medicine, Health, and Society. This has really been a wonderful conference so far. And um, like I said, my name is Jennifer Singh, and I just want to acknowledge my working group. Um, I'm an associate professor at Georgia Tech in the School of History and Sociology. And um, I just started being involved last year in this wonderful working group uh, at, uh, in the Atlanta-based area. So we're funded by the Georgia Tech Provost. We're multidisciplinary. We're multi-institutional. So uh, there's Georgia Tech. There's Spelman College. There is uh, Emory University. We also come from many different disciplines, ranging from biomedical engineering, applied physiology, chemistry, sociology, oops, sorry. There we go. And, and uh, so sociology, public health, public policy, women's health. So we really are coming at this question very differently. So as a group, we realize that setting HIV really makes sense, especially in the South, it's, it's a really big problem, as I'll demonstrate today. And you know, we're coming at it from multiple perspectives, um, and which can really help us begin to uh, interrogate uh, and think more critically about this issue. So I want to start with an early 1990s campaign. It says, AIDS does not discriminate. And in the bottom there, which you probably can't see, it, said, it states, anyone can get AIDS from such sexual contact or sharing needles with an infected person, but we know how to prevent AIDS. Learn how to protect yourself. So at one level, this is actually a good message, right? Um, it's an ideal. It encourages us to have compassion for anyone and everyone that has AIDS, because we're all at risk. Um, however, the message is on prevention that really targets individual behavior. Twenty years later, in reality, um, AIDS does discriminate and, um, cause, and the, therefore the causes and the preventions should not just be at the individual personal behavioral level. 
So this is a map of the U.S. that shows the 2010 rate of adults and adolescents living with a diagnosis of HIV and, uh, or AIDS. The darker the color, the higher the rate per 100,000 people. Like many other maps that we've seen at this conference, there are higher rates of HIV in the South compared to the rest of the country. <coughs> So thinking about this from an intersectional approach, we've been, as a group, collecting lots of different data to try to unpack structural <coughs> inequalities that can help explain these patterns. So first, we can look at poverty rates across the country. This is a map of America's poor and the percent by region of total U.S. Um, percent of total U.S. below the poverty line. So again, the South in 1969 and again today has and continues to be the poorest geographical region in the U.S. and is twice as poor compared to other parts of the country. The CDC estimates that 2.1 percent of heterosexuals living in high poverty urban areas in the U.S. are HIV positive. Uh, this rate is well above 1 percent that designates a generalized epidemic. Poverty will most certainly hinder access to HIV prevention, resources, lack of health uh, care, and other social services. However, social class is really only one part of the equation. And uh, you know, as we've learned in this conference, uh, and I'll come back to this, since residents, is res folks that are living in these poor communities are overwhelmingly black and Latino. This next map is the incarceration rate for uh, uh, 100,000 residents in 2010. And um, again, we see higher rates of incarceration in the South compared to other parts of the country. So why is this important to HIV AIDS? Um, so over the last years, the war on drugs have really massively increased both the size of prison population and the cycling in and out of prisons, which has disproportionately impacted Latino and African communities. Evidence suggests that this mass incarceration boom has contributed to the social context in which HIV and other STIs proliferate, linking prisons with neighborhoods. Black males who have sex with men who have sex with men, MSM, are also more likely to proliferate, uh, are also more likely to proliferate Sorry. Uh, black SMM are also more likely uh, than other S MSM to report a history of incarceration, um, are more likely to become infected because of risky behaviors, and the cycling in and out of prison also becomes a risk of forming new sexual connections uh, with a pool of individuals who are, who are more prone to high risk behaviors. And so, you know, we're seeing um, these trends. This is another map that shows a lifetime risk of HIV diagnosis by state. So I live in Georgia right now, so just, you know, I, I'm, I'm a risk here. Um, we all are. But, I mean, it's a little more complicated than that. Because racial geography matters as well. Um, so this slide begins to interrogate this intersection between race and class, and, and I don't know if you can see it here, but each dot represents a family group um, from the 2010 census. And you can see the green dots here are black families, the blue are white, and the orange are Hispanic. You can see class here. And, you can, and, and so we're seeing like where people are living, um, the places in which people live. Uh, this is referred to, uh, with what I learned, as the black belt, these, these three um, dots, and really uh, reflects the patterns of HIV that I showed you earlier. So if we let, take a closer look by county um, and stratify by race, we can see a stark difference between black and white um, HIV uh, diagnosis of age or HIV in 2020. <coughs> HIV and AIDS does discriminate. So what might help explain this? Sure. Every month, okay. Uh, so as I indicated earlier, poverty affects neighborhood conditions, which are important in HIV transmission because neighborhood and resident characteristics, they mutually reinforce one another uh, to, and contribute to health outcomes. 
Among inner city blacks, neighborhoods that experience decades of racial segregation through formal and informal policies and practices throughout the 20th century have really dealt a critical economic blow um, with the decline of jobs, white flight, and then the reduction in, in policies that would help with community health and other financial assistance. This in turn has really created a vulnerable population, vulnerable communities to things like HIV. Uh, neighborhood conditions also foster a network of, of dynamics that drive the epidemic. So like other social networks, sexual and drug networks can continue or confine or spread HIV within and across communities in ways that parallel social and economic exchanges. This, of course, is compounded by the lack of resources, which may hamper the widespread distribution of prevention and treatment efforts. So who is at risk for HIV AIDS? We can see here that black in the South, black S MSM, white <coughs> MSM, Latino MSM, followed by heterosexual women. Clearly, HIV does discriminate, and really understanding these uh, Statistics requires a deeper interrogation that looks at the durable historical patterns of poverty, segregation, incarceration, and policies that limit social and economic resources. Okay, so this is a more current campaign um, um, by Greater uh, Atlanta, Greater Georgia Greater Than AIDS, and it highlights community and how important community is in terms of living with AIDS. This is a, a good step. It's taking away from the individual and looking um, at the community. The CDC is also beginning to acknowledge structural factors such as poverty, such as uh, income inequality, lack of health insurance, even racism. But what we're finding is that when it comes to prevention efforts, they're really targeted at the individual level. And um, one of the things that we've done is try to see, well, do, are these messages getting to younger people uh, that live in the South? And so we conducted a survey with students in, that we have access to in our universities and found that students think they know a lot about AIDS, but they don't have a high level of the knowledge, especially when it comes to the risk in the South. And they don't necessarily think they're at risk. And so, um, our conclusion is really kind of call and open to a question to think about what should public health campaigns look like that really target structural inequalities? And I think this is one, and this isn't just for AIDS, this is for lots of things that we're talking about um, in these conferences, at this conference, and hopefully more. So that's my time. Exactly. <laughs> Um, I feel like with all these fabulous presentations about incredibly serious and important issues that I'm going to be kind of the comic relief here. Not, not comic, but perhaps um, a somewhat lighter issue, but hopefully something uh, that has bigger implications that we can have an interesting conversation about. So, um, one day in 1985, two severe circumcision-related accidents took place at Northside Hospital in Atlanta. In two separate incidents involving two different physicians, two infant boys, one of them black, suffered severe electrical burns to their penises um, from the electric cauterizing needle used in the procedure. One of the boys was burned so badly that his entire penis sloughed off and his parents decided to raise him as a girl. The other infant's parents claimed that he had been, quote, rendered permanently unable to lead a normal life as a male. The lawsuits were settled for millions. Different social groups, apologize for the small, <coughs> uh, different social groups reacted to the, to the accidents in, in distinctive ways. Medical professionals generally stress that circumcision is very safe and that such accidents are very rare and the result of negligence or poor, poor training. Um, in contrast, opponents of circumcision, who include mostly um, grassroots activists and some doctors and nurses, use the accidents in Atlanta as an occasion to call for the abandonment of all routine infant circumcision. Right? Um, no circumcision, no horrible accidents. All right, so what does this story tell us? Um, first, routine or preventive circumcision uh, in infancy was and still is controversial. Different groups see different costs and benefits, health and otherwise. 
And because routine circumcision is not evenly distributed throughout the US population, but varies by race, region, and social class, and I'll discuss that in a minute, uh, it's a kind of thing gives us an opportunity to think about how we think about health disparities, um, particularly when it comes to health issues that are contested or ambiguous, or where there's not a lot of consensus about whether they should be treated as health-related in the first place. So the questions I want to ask today are, do racial, regional, and social class differences in circumcision rates represent meaningful disparities? If so, what kind of disparities are they? Um, and can we thinking about the ways that social groups determine which differences should be seen as disparities um, help us have a more productive conversation about health disparities <coughs> in general? So to answer these questions, I'm going to walk you through a very, very, very brief history of circumcision in the US drawing the data that I've been collecting for a broader project comparing the US, Canada, and Britain. Uh, these data cover the years from 1985 to 2015 and come from in-depth interviews, news coverage, participant <coughs> observations, and materials I've collected from activists, medical professionals, religious groups, and lots and lots of other kind of stakeholders. And I'm happy to answer any questions in, in Q&A. To be very clear, um, my goal today is not to determine whether routine circumcision is right or wrong. Um, there's um, strong opinions pointing in both directions. Um, and the bulk of evidence in my readings suggests that the answer actually lies very much somewhere in between. Um, so my aim instead is to turn the lens of cultural sociology onto a medicalized practice as a way of thinking about what we mean when we talk about health disparities um, and what the scholarly and practical implications of those meanings might be. So, uh, as most of you probably know, male circumcision, the surgical removal of the foreskin of the penis, uh, historically was a ritual performed in the Jewish and Muslim faiths and in some African cultures. But the surgery was also popularized by Anglo-American physicians in the late 1800s, um, and they thought circumcision could cure or prevent <coughs> all kinds of ills, from paralysis to masturbation to sexually transmitted infections, which they then called venereal disease. Notably, circumcision began as an elite practice. It costs money, and as well-off urban women increasingly gave birth in hospitals, not homes, <coughs> circumcision kind of became part of the, the standard package of birth procedures uh, that would happen uh, for boys in the US. And there's some evidence that upper and middle class parents had their sons circumcised in part because they saw it as a sign of distinction. It made their boys seem different and better, uh, in their opinion, than um, boys who were working class or poor or immigrant rights, whites or African Americans. But circumcision did not remain elite. Hospital births, uh, and therefore circumcision, became more common among all race and class groups in the US. The US military ran campaigns to circumcise the troops during the world wars. And some public health efforts targeted African American men on the highly disputable grounds that they were dirty and plagued by disease. The post-war expansion of private health insurance also contributed to increases in <coughs> circumcision rates. And so by 1970, about 90% of newborn males in the US are circumcised. Um, in effect, whatever disparity uh, that may have existed was sort of resolved because almost every U.S. male was circumcised. But was circumcision health enhancing in the first place? That's what physicians in the 1960s and 70s started asking, and they began to determine that there really wasn't any scientific evidence at that time uh, that showed that circumcision had the, the benefits that proponents said it did. So the American Academy of Pediatrics in 1975 um, comes out with a statement that circumcision is medically unnecessary. By the mid-1980s, the time of the Atlanta accidents that I told you about, a grassroots anti-circumcision movement had emerged, arguing that circumcision was needlessly painful, that the risks far outweighed the benefits, and that circumcision violates the individual's right to decide what happens to his own body. And a couple of things happen after that. Uh, first, some private insurers and multiple state Medicaid systems, including five in the South, began dropping circumcision from the procedures they covered, I, I mean routine preventive, not if it's medically indicated, um, therefore making circumcision less available to for, poor families who might otherwise choose it. Uh, and second, circumcision rates decline. Uh, the statistics we have say to about 65%, that's almost surely an underestimate because the boys were circumcised after they leave the hospital. Um, but still, between 1979 and 1999, circumcision rates declined nationally, but actually increased in the Midwest and the South. And in the South, much, much of this change was due to circumcision becoming more common among African Americans. At the same time, affluent white families started um, increasingly rejecting circumcision, in part related to embracing natural childbirth. 
So in short, by the early 2000s, there were once again fairly substantial and growing circumcision differences by race, class, and region. Meanwhile, medical proponents of circumcision remained convinced that it had health benefits. In the early 2000s, three random uh, clinical trials in Sub-Saharan Africa found that circumcision reduced female to male transmission of HIV by about 50%, and other research found that circumcision reduced rates of urinary tract infections among boys. On the other, you know, so on the one hand, this sounds great, right? Good news, we're gonna solve health problems. Um, on the other hand, boys' urinary tract and uh, UTI risk is already very small, it's about 2%, so you're cutting a small number in half. Um, and um, the HIV circumcision findings don't necessarily translate very well to the US context, um, for a lot of reasons, nor does circumcision, it doesn't work well enough uh, to reduce the, or eliminate the <coughs> need to practice safer sex. So 2012, uh, the AAP revo revises its policies to be slightly in favor of circumcision without actually recommending it as a routine practice. Um, and the policy stresses that circumcision is beneficial enough that insurance companies ought to cover it. Um, we haven't seen much change there yet. I've had a graduate student who's been looking at all the sort of state Medicare and Medicaid and ACA and all of this stuff for me. She hasn't found anybody who said, yeah, we're funding it again. Uh, but I think we will see that soon. Uh, certainly the failure of some states to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act means that low-income parents <coughs> in states where Medicaid covers circumcision will continue to lack access um, to, to the procedure if that's what they want, especially in the South, for as we know, only two states in the South have adopted the expansion. Um, at the same time, I think circumcision opponents, opponents have had some influence in popular opinion, particularly when it comes to claims that circumcision reduces male sexual pleasure uh, and that people should get to decide what happens to their bodies. Uh, and in fact, that's an argument that the medical community has been increasingly receptive to. For instance, when it comes to um, the case of interventions for uh, infants born with intersex conditions. So, you know, what, what, what's actually going to happen is remains to be seen. Um, but to summarize, I'll return to the question, do racial, ethnic, regional, and social class differences in circumcision rates represent health disparities? Are southern or black or poor males being disproportionately deprived of bodily autonomy and subjected to surgical risk? Or are they disproportionately benefiting from an important public <coughs> health intervention? Um, should doctors at Northside Hospital be performing more circumcisions or fewer circumcisions? Um, how people answer these questions depends on their culturally shaped stance towards the practice which depends on who they are, where they live, what they do for a living, and so on. Um, and I'll just stop there. Thank you. in with uh, look at one of the an interesting concepts that we found in moving from the north to the south we immediately had these conversations about what the differences were I'm a social worker my wife is a nurse and she would bring home these wonderful stories about the patients and what they would say so we thought we'd start by saying what isn't a difference between the north and the south and we thought we'd give you these cool maps you're at a conference you're doing a poster you know put up some maps so you can, <laughs> right it's like a requirement so you're seeing just the change in colors you're seeing america getting a bit more heavy increasingly heavy but the the colors are changing and we get to 2014 and you're seeing this region of the north, not the extreme north, not the New England area so much, but the north and the south don't have as much difference as you might think. And then we looked at, hey, well, activity is changing around the country as well. A couple of things <coughs> in this slide. Jobs where you are more active are down, of course. That makes sense. But then also, school children in 1969, 40% of them, like one of every two almost, walked to school or biked to school. 
That's unheard of, and the, the data bears that out now. It's down, at least in 2001, to 13%. That's one in every 10? Wow. Um, our last piece was this, I thought this was a, a funny slide. It could be considered a, a high risk to not have vigorous activity. Like we're, we're, we're making up things to be afraid of now. So what I want to talk about um, is a case study that, can you hear me? I want to talk about a case study and this is kind of mimics what I see at the bedside during a, a nursing shift. So you have a patient who comes in and they come in with different amounts of symptoms. I mean, some may be heart related, some may be stroke related. In this case, Betty's is stroke. So we do our normal assessment and we talk to them about what we see. So usually what I do with my assessment is we look down at what could be contributing to why they're here. Most of the time, they, there's no, um, they don't see the relationship most of the time or at least they're not admitting the relationship. But coming from the north and then doing nursing in the south, the thing that I see that is different in the south is this indignant attitude towards lifestyle. So one of the first things I heard when I got here was, we girls are big here, we like to eat, you know. So don't tell me <laughs> what I can't have, you know. So it was like, okay, <laughs> but this is contributing to this, you know. But this is kind of like the, the whole picture. So they don't understand the lifestyle components. So the obesity, the tobacco is a big thing. So my grandfather smoked for so many years, so I smoked, nothing's wrong with him. Well, he doesn't come into the hospital a lot. So we don't hook people up to monitors, and that's what I tell people. They're not always hooked up to a monitor to know what's going on with them until they come into the hospital and we see the clinical signs. So another thing is, um, a big thing at the bottom there where she said, I'll just take what I need when, I, when the time comes. And I've heard that a lot. Where's that pill that you guys can just give us to help this out? I mean, we can be done with this. Just give me the pill. Don't tell me I need to change anything. So we don't have a magic pill, you know. So <laughs> that leads to the discussion about, yeah. so what are you going to do in these types of situations? Let's assume this, uh, this approach to a critical case study is a sound way of approaching this, this uh, question. Uh, we don't have to assume very much because this actually happens. I mean, this is the reality uh, of the experience. What we thought is there's a lot of research now on cognitive restructuring. And our challenge is whether doctors and medical professionals are in the habit of challenging the behavior patterns, the lifestyle of the patient. Well, there's a big piece that I thought would be important, and maybe this is my social work talking, but trauma has to be understood here first. Uh, so we talk typically with trauma about someone having a really horrible experience and that creates the trauma and then there's behaviors that come out of that. But I want to expand that idea, and this is the work that we're doing, to expand this idea of trauma because it's not just what happened. It really is how it impacts your choice behavior. And so we actually have some pretty good backup for this in the CDC studies and Kaiser studies on these adverse childhood experiences. So what we put together is this framework. The trauma occurs, and this is, this is mirrored to somewhat introduced in the ACE uh, research. Trauma happens, it diminishes the choices, but then there's a justification narrative because you've, out of these diminished grouping of choices, you have to make a decision. You're going to then justify that decision by some means, and then we are gonna see the health behavior. What's really challenging here, especially in our experience in the South, is working with the justification because the justification is cultural it's cultural identity and so i'm not just saying you should probably adopt some different behaviors 
I'm actually asking you to rewrite a part of your story. And it's, it's difficult to do that psychologically. Um, medically, <coughs> adding in that intersectionality may be even more difficult. So when rewriting the story, we found that these are some of the main areas that um, people have going on. So a lack of support, um, and a lot of it, like we were talking about the Southern culture, it's um, if you haven't had this or if you don't do this, that means you're not Southern, you're not part of the South. You know, we do this here. But and that's a really hard thing to kind of restructure in people's mind what that means. I, I said to a group of students, so uh, when you're cooking your greens, let's, let's just use turkey. And it was sacrilege, it was, you know, uh, it, it was not a good see. You, you guys know what you're supposed to, are you guys from the South? Do you know what you're supposed to use in greens? Yeah. <laughs> Who said fat back? Ham hot? See? Is that right? The healthiest thing ever, right? Doesn't matter. Delicious, right? So this idea of, uh, from my point of view as a social worker, uh, in, in Tanya's world, it's holistic health, maybe, um, dare we say, alternative medicine kind of thing. In my world, it's <laughs> ecological systems where we talk about sustainable habits of the individual, but then we expand that to look at the relationships that they have in their communities, and we're talking, I'm glad to have the Divinity School representative because churches are a great place where we get this culture uh, reinforced. Uh, are we having baked chicken for our after church dinner or is it going to be deep fried and then the lady who brings the uh, bacon fried? You know, okay. <laughs> this is after lunch. This should be but a clear social role is another important piece, and that gets into the uh, justification of the choice, the choice process, the choice behavior. And then this, this uh, last piece that we kind of gave a few red points, uh, the healthy environment piece, and that's actually what Tanya's working on, is actually transitioning into health coach mode and doing some of these environmental checks to make it easier for people. The, the piece is that we're, we're not going to be able to change people's behavior completely, but we can make it easier for them to have the things that they love and maybe have it in different ways that are just as tasty, but you're going to have to show it to them. Uh, one of the things I think is really helpful that I've done at the bedside is talk about how valuable the patients are. And that has, um, that kind of opens up their eyes that you know, I need to be here for my family because I am valuable. Because at some point, they don't feel like, so we're all going to die of something. Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, I have that type of attitude. But when I talk about, well, what about this? And what about who you are and your purpose and what you want? And, you know, they start kind of thinking about, I do have to make some changes because this is who I am. This is what I want to do. Um, in this scenario, which everybody's story doesn't end up like Betty's, but most people... So the last thing I want to say is that you can still have the Southern heritage. It just can be celebrated a different way. Thank you. last minute fill in, which means I do not have a PowerPoint. I will not meet the prerequisite of having a grab. Um, but if you want to look one up on your phone as I say words and pretend to be poorly. So I am a co-director at the Anna Julie Cooper Center. I was really pleased to co-host this conference with MHS to have a long-standing, even though we're in their second year, long-standing looking towards the future, a partnership with MHS to host conferences that think about health in the South. 
Um, our center is focused on intersectional scholarship. The three salient identity points that we really think about are gender, race, and region. Um, and region can look a lot of different ways, but we end up focusing on the South a lot, like uh, Angela Cooper, who said that it was very important to focus not just the intersections of gender and race, but also think about how region impacts the story that we are hearing. Um, so I'm actually not here to present any research, but more um, some of the work that we're doing to think about research and the importance of intersectional scholarship. And so just as a kind of brief example, and this isn't from our own research, but there is an organization called No More, it's a national organization focused on uh, domestic violence and um, sexual abuse. And they uh, are well-funded and they do a lot of programming around, you know, how do we intervene in domestic violence, how do we combat domestic violence and end it. Um, but what intersectionality tells us is that when you ask those questions, you have to ask them very specifically, and when you collect data, you have to disaggregate that data. You have to look at what that disaggregated data is telling you in order to really develop solutions so that you're not just targeting, which happens to <coughs> white women and how white women are experiencing domestic violence. So recently they just did the largest study of domestic violence and sexual abuse in the United States. You would be surprised at how kind of basic the questions are for the largest national study, which kind of tells us a little bit about the state of intersectional scholarship. Um, and what they found is that the number one reason um, for uh, Latino women to not report domestic violence is fear of deportation. If you do not ask specifically Latino women why they're not reporting, you miss that. And you can't develop programs that are actually addressing why women are reporting. Um, and so now, after they did that research, they developed an entirely new campaign specifically targeting Latino women because they know something different. Um, and so that's just a, a little example of why intersectional research is really important. Um, and so what our center is currently working on, in addition to a variety of things, are two kind of national outward-facing initiatives that think about how collaboration and partnership can really improve the state of intersectional research overall. So one of these is called the Collaborative to Advance Equity Through Research. Um, this is a new coalition. Um, it was launched in November of 2015 um, at a, white House, a conference that we co-hosted with the White House Council on Women and Girls. Um, that was focused on research on women and girls of color. Um, and the Collaborative is a coalition of institutions that do research. Um, so this is not just colleges and universities, it's also nonprofit organizations, um, small community organizations, it's seminaries, um, it's a variety of spaces, but all who are committed to supporting and advancing research, specifically addressing the lives of women and girls of color. Um, and it is about each of these institutions making commitments at their own institution to advancing this work. And that looks differently based on different institutions because all these institutions have different uh, resources available, they have different missions. And so um, it is both a way to support this research happening overall by giving institutions a kind of body that they can attach it to. We know that one of the things that happens with scholarship addressing the lives of women and girls of color is that it is, seen, it is deemed unimportant even in academic spaces. Um, it is seen as marginal, it is seen as um, uh, not passing muster, not being rigorous, um, and that makes it hard for the research to advance, to get financial support for young researchers, to find mentorship and support on their own campuses who say that this research matters and is important and is based on a large body of scholarship that we think of scholarship very broadly goes back decades, if not centuries. Um, and the other thing that's exciting is that each of these institutions have representatives that will come together to think about how research is taking place across different institution types across the country. Um, so we will have our first convening next month um, where folks will think about what are the interesting innovative types of partnerships that we can have between universities or between universities and community-based organizations. Look at a state organization who is fighting to secure funding for this scholarship um, in a uh, political climate uh, that maybe is going line by line through the university budget and isn't terribly supportive. You know, what kind of thing can they learn and support with a community-based organization in New Orleans doing research on the South and health? Um, what can they learn from a seminary in New York? Or is there a partnership between those three institutions that can help uh, bring more resources, more attention to this work, and advance it in different ways that we don't know yet? And so we are, NHS is a member of the collaborative, um, Wake Forest University is a member of the collaborative. If your institution thinks that you would like to join the collaborative, please let me know after, we would be quite thrilled. Um, 
And one of the great things about the collaborative is it provides an instant body for the next kind of national initiative that we are currently working on, which is, we are calling the intersectional research. <coughs> um, you know, intersectionality, of course, building on the scholarship of Kimberly Crenshaw. And what this is is really asking three questions and spending about a year to two years working with folks across the country to answer them. Those questions are, what is the current landscape of research addressing the lives of women and girls of color? What do we know? based on what scholarship has taught us so far. And once we know that, what are the deficits? What are the gaps? What questions still haven't been asked? What do we need to know? And then once we've laid that out, to think through, now what do we do? How do we bring more resources to this work? How do we develop new partnerships that advance this work? Um, you know, what are the partnerships and actions that can swiftly and sub substantively improve our knowledge? And then we really want to think through an input and output question. The input is, are we asking the right questions as researchers, particularly from the standpoint of the academy? Are we relying on community knowledge as valid and true and as guiding us to ask the right kinds of questions with the tools of the academy? And then the output question is, how is this research being translated into the public? How is it being translated to funders, to policymakers, to people who are developing programs? How are we making sure the like, researchers are actually asking the right questions but then when they are answered, that they can then become tools for change, that they can become tools for social justice. So I don't have any of those answers yet, but that is what we're trying to do with this initiative. Um, and one of the methods that we are using to do that is um, hosting or working with other folks, particularly including our collaborative members, to host small roundtable conversations, bringing together researchers from one institution, multiple institutions, a researcher, a policymaker, a community organization, you know, a, a variety of folks, to think through these three questions based on the individual standpoint of the folks at the table. And um, it's been a really wonderful experience, and if any of you guys uh, would like more information about those roundtables, hosting a roundtable, participating in a roundtable, um, you know, we're kind of going to start rolling out and doing them across the country in the next few years, and I would love to talk to you after. Thanks. Gonzalez and I'm a new assistant professor of health policy here at Vanderbilt in the School of Medicine. I want to ask for a little bit of mercy. This is my first spring in, uh, in Nashville and uh, the pollen and the allergies are just killing me. So I sound a little more nasally than usual. Um, but today I'm going to talk about LGBT health disparities in the, in the U.S. South. I, I'm sorry, never mind. <laughs> Um, so today's agenda, I was originally going to speak on, the, uh, on health disparities at the intersections of sexual orientation and race and ethnicity, but I, I just think that there are too many pressing and important policy issues happening in the South right now that's affecting all LGBT people, or people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, um, whether they're white or non-white. Um, but before I get into those issues, uh, I, I want to start off with a high note. Um, last year was a major victory, uh, a victory year for LGBT people. The Supreme Court case Overridge Bell v. Uh, Hodges legalized same-sex marriage in every corner of the country, including including parts uh, in the South, uh, like Tennessee. Um, that's incredible progress in the last five years. This is a map uh, displaying uh, same-sex marriage in 2011, and you can see that same-sex marriage was only legal in six states. Uh, and so six states in orange. Uh, civil unions were legal in those. Uh, three or four states in green, and domestic partnerships and other rights were available in several other states. Uh, well, here's that same map now in 2016 <laughs> that, 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 that shows um, um, same-sex marriage is available across the country um, following the Supreme Court case. Um, I think this tells another story, is that we can be map changers uh, when, we, when we engage ourselves in the legal, political, and policy processes. So I hope that you, you see all of these these, uh, these maps showing obesity in the South, HIV and AIDS uh, uh, incidents happening in the South. Um, but when you leave this, this conference, I hope that one of the goals you take with you is to be a map changer. Um, now, to switch gears uh, to a more darker side of the story, uh, it's, it's mainly focusing around the backlash happening following the legalization of same-sex marriage. And the he headlines tell a different story. These are just a few headlines from the Tennessean. 
Uh, the Tennessee House passes resolution criticizing same-sex marriage decision. House committee advances bathroom bill against transgender people. Uh, Senate passes bill giving religious protection to therapists, which would allow mental health providers from providing health, uh, mental health services uh, to LGBT people based on their, on their religious beliefs. Uh, fear loathing drive anti-gay transgender bills in Tennessee. Well, these problems are not just unique to Tennessee. They're happening all around us, uh, all around these southern states. Um, Kentucky just recently passed a bill that creates straight and gay, and, and gay marriage license forms, which essentially is segregating marriage between, uh, for heterosexuals versus uh, LGBT people. And this uh, happened this sparked after the, uh, the Kim Davis uh, incidents and, and news uh, stories. Um, recently in Alabama, the Supreme Court um, uh, uh, denounced and said that, that, same, that our same-sex marriage ban will still hold in the state. And they've gone back and forth on this, but finally, uh, last week or the week before, um, they re begrudgingly okay same-sex marriage. Um, when we begin to think beyond same-sex marriage, though, um, these, you, these problems are not unique to the South. Um, this is a map showing where, uh, where, where LGBT people can be fired uh, by their employers based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. The so states in gray lack anti-discrimination laws uh, in employment. Um, here's a, a map showing um, non-discrimination in housing. So those states in blue protect uh, gender, uh, sexual, minor sexual and gender minorities, and those states in green only protect sexual minorities, those people who are lesbian, gay, and bisexual. In the remaining gray states, um, LGBT people can, can not, may, may not find housing based on their, on their uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. Here is um, another map showing non-discrimination laws and public accommodations. You might be seeing a pattern. It's the same states that, that consistently provide the same laws. But, but those, those states not protecting LGBT, people, LGBT populations are, uh, are, are largely in the South and in the uh, upper Midwest. Um, here are, here's a map of, of hate crime laws protecting um, sexual and gender minorities. Um, and you can see consistently along this, um, I believe someone described it as the black belt earlier, right around here, where um, LGBT people are not protected, even under hate crime laws. So what does our research tell us? Um, we've done a lot of research on the effects of same-sex marriage on health and access to care, and they consistently say the same story. Same-sex marriage improves health and, and access to care for LGBT populations. Um, uh, a study in, Cal in California demonstrated that uh, after uh, the state legalized same-sex marriage, LGBT people reported uh, less psychological distress. Um, in Massachusetts, um, LGBT people uh, had fewer mental health care visits um, after the state legalized marriage. And in New York, there were insurance gains and in, uh, in, in health insurance coverage uh, following the enactment of, of gay marriage in that state. Um, but there's much less research on, on, uh, on the other laws. And so um, I'm going to present some findings from a preliminary and very early study uh, looking at the effects of comprehensive protections for LGBT people. And those protections include um, laws that uh, uh, offer marriage um, and protection and uh, anti-discrimination protection in employment, housing, education, and, uh, and adoptions for same-sex couples. So um, these, uh, this study uses data from the 2014 Behavioral Risk Factors Surveillance System, which is one of the nation's main surveys to monitor health behaviors, access to care. Um, and in 2014, for the first time, this, this, the CDC allowed states to add, uh, to, uh, to add sexual orientation and gender identity to their state surveys. And only 19 states took advantage of that opportunity. Um, so the, the, this is the question that's asked on sexual orientation. Do you consider yourself to be straight, lesbian, or gay, <coughs> bisexual, other, don't know, not sure, or refuse? And the sample sizes are indicated here. Um, and so what I'm doing in this study is dividing up the sample based on the policy environment in, in those states. Um, and uh, this, these are the results for frequent mental distress, which is measured by, uh, stress, by experiencing stress, depression, or emotional problems for, 14, for two, uh, two weeks or more in the previous month. Um, and we see this gradient happening across, uh, across the LGBT, L uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual population. Um, um, those uh, uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people living in states without any protections report the highest levels of frequent mental distress or, or mental health problems. 
those, those LGBT people living in states with comprehensive protections report the lowest. It's, it's a seven percentage point reduction in the probability of having a mental health problem. That doesn't seem like a lot, um, but it's, it's one out of four versus one out of five people um, when, you, when, you think about it, uh, 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 when you think about the effect size. Now, since this is a session on intersectional, inter intersectionality, um, I asked the question, are these findings similar for LGBT people of color? Um, here are the results first for uh, white, lesbian, gay, and bisexual. We see the same gradient um, across state policy environments. Now, when we look at our at, uh, uh, LGBT non-white counterparts, the effect doesn't happen as much or as strong uh, across policy environments. Um, so just to wrap up, some of my key findings here. Um, lesbian, gay, bisexual people in states with comprehensive protections are much less likely to report mental health problems. Um, and, those, and those improvements in mental health uh, by policy environments are less striking for non-white LGBT people. This could be based off of a different, uh, a fact, uh, 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 many different reasons. Um, maybe uh, non-white LGBT people have, uh, uh, are experiencing, are, are less likely to report or self-report their sexual orientation. They might have other factors associated with their race and ethnicity that provide some resiliency or, uh, or, or, or um, other factors that are affecting their mental health. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, I look forward to your comments or your tips on, on improving this study. And if I don't get to your questions, please feel free to email me or to follow me on Twitter. Thank you. very wide-ranging approach to um, intersectionality. And so uh, my, I won't call it a response, but my comments will do two things. Just give you some impressions that I have and ask a couple questions to start us off on the Q&A. Um, one of the things that struck me is that the language of intersectionality, which um, seems to be both the rage as in used what I would call without clear definition and also the necessity. So one of the questions I'm going to have is to ask each of you to define how what you mean by intersectionality, which leads to um, a, a concern or interest that I have, and that is very often when we talk about um, intersectionality, um, our conversations can, can become quite disembodied. And I raise that because I think the very things that you're talking about get inscribed on bodies and lived, um, which, which was um, hinted at throughout all the papers, but get lived in embodied form in various communities. So I'd like us to think about what does that mean for your work? Um, particularly the issue around bodies being inscribed with um, your research. Um, the other piece that I, would, I wonder if you could talk about, what are the implications of your research for strategies that universities and, of course, divinity schools might uh, appropriate, if you will? And my final um, thought was that I was a little surprised that um, we didn't hear more about the place, given the increase, uh, at least the increase in religious pluralism, what is the place of religious institutions? And when I say religious institutions, I, I mean that in the most pluralistic way, not, not just um, Christian congregations, but we could certainly look at um, differences in Christian congregations. But um, religious plural pluralism as we know it in the South, and what are the strategies that we might appropriate for bringing um, different religious groups together in the service of strategies, particularly around um, policy um, changes. Thank you. I guess you can start with um, panelists responding to the questions that Phyllis just posed, and then we can open it up for discussion. We have 
about 15 minutes. <coughs> Um, I think I think the microphone. Do we need to turn it on? Yeah. Is it on? Talk pretty loud. Thank you, Phyllis, for your for your comments and um, starting this work um, and thinking about intersectionality and, and doing research. I mean, this this idea of what is what what constitutes these interactions and what what pieces matter um, and. As a working group, I think we're still figuring, figuring this out. Um, some of us hadn't ever heard of this idea of intersectionality or maybe thought about it in a different way, um, but didn't actually have a name. But I think for HIV and AIDS, it's certainly this interaction between the intersections of race, um, social class, and sexuality. Um, for, for HIV and AIDS, and I'm sh and um, but thinking about that interaction, at least for me, and I, I mean, maybe I'm not speaking for the group here, but thinking about that interaction on multiple levels and how structural, how it affects, how structural, institutional factors shape that individual experience, right? And um, I love I love that you're from the Divinity School because one of the the things that came up in our discussions around the survey. Uh, that we uh, did uh, college students, we, we, we tried to assess where their knowledge was coming from, um, and it definitely was not coming from you know, a religious organization, um, or the primary care providers for that matter. Um, so um, these are important places that the conversation could occur around um, sexuality. Um, and risk for HIV, and, and, and certainly within the, the African American community. And so this is some discussion that we had as a, as a working group in thinking about, about this. And why, why is it that this you know, is not talked about in, in, in such a very strong community part of people's lives? Um, yeah, thanks for great food for thought questions. Um, yeah, so um, circumcision is one of those cases where intersectionality actually gets literally inscribed on the body in ways that are, that are very, very obvious uh, in terms of gender. And of course, I was talking about male circumcision, but we might also think about female genital cutting <coughs> as different but related. Um, certainly, so I, I, I think um, a few of my students are in the audience, so they will know that I think about intersectionality you know, as a way of, of thinking past the sort of additive models of oppression, you know, one more point of oppression if you're a woman, one more point if you're a racial ethnic minority, that kind of thing. And thinking about the really complex ways that um, gender, race, and class, and sexual identity, and also age and disability, and sometimes religion and national origin um, come together to, to really profoundly shape people's life experiences and their life chances. Um, in the case of, you know, so in the, in the case of male circumcision, I, I think, you know, some of the places that we might think about this um, very specifically would be the ways that inequalities in terms of poor delivery of a procedure may get inscribed on particular bodies, right? The chances of you having a botched procedure, uh, you know, a botched circumcision um, could be greater, for, for example, um, in context and frankly we see that um, with the scaling up of um, male circumcision uh, in sub-Saharan Africa um, in poor communities and where they're where they're doing lots of circumcisions really really fast um, the, the uh, accident rates are, are rather large and disturbing um, that's simply not true I is it not at all uh, the, the evidence from the Kenyan uh, uh, data which is the largest mm -hmm. Program in the world is that the more circumcisions that are being done, the accident rates are declining. Oh, interesting. Well, so it would be like the way Moyles have a have a better. I'm also shocked by your mm -hmm. juxtaposition of male circumcision, which is being done for medical purposes, with female genital mutilation, which is a, a, a cultural tradition with no medical benefit at all, with immense medical harm. Thanks. Thank you for that perspective. Um, I want to let everyone else on the panel have a chance to answer the questions first, and then we'll return to your discussion. 
Um, I, I will say um, just uh, briefly, the uh, role, thinking in terms of the role of religious institutions uh, in policy, um, one of the one of the activists that I've talked to has said that the one place that she that that she I and mean, she was joking, but she was not joking, um, that the effort in San Francisco to ban male circumcision before the age of eighteen um, brought together Muslim and Jewish activists in a way that nothing else she had ever seen in the area. In our thoughts, the definition of intersectionality. For me, I'm, I'm on the, uh, as you may have noticed in the, the presentation, I'm on the behavior choice side of the definition. So the idea is similar to what we just heard, the complexity is the biggest question. So how does uh, another point of intersection impact your decision making? How does it change the decision, change the choices that are available to you but then also impact your choice. And in the ACES research, you see that very pronounced, this idea that I, I don't have the same choices you have because of different factors. Um, and that, that's really, the interesting side to me is predicting what the choices will be of individuals. Uh, thinking about uh, operational research is, is kind of that general area for me variance and emergence in the context of intersection, intersectionality. So you see this, this ability to predict, just like we predict traffic patterns. We, we can predict what people are going to do. And so what, just like traffic patterns, what are some of the indicators that we put in place to change these, the trajectory, the, the travel pattern of individuals? We put medians in roads. We set timers on um, stoplights. These are the types of things that we do. Well, where are the institutions that are going to do this in a social context? Uh, don't get me started on churches as the saving grace of <coughs> communities, potentially, potentially. So, so where, where do you come in as a, a faculty member in particular um, it is really my real interest because We've got to communicate to pastors that, that amazing role that they have. I was just watching the television, and I'm passing the mic as I'm talking to not take up the rest of the time. I was just watching on the television um, a pastor delivering his sermon, and he said to his group of congreg his congregation, he said, repeat after me. And they all repeated. That is power. I can't do that in my classroom. <laughs> right? Good morning, students. <coughs> yeah, it was good. <laughs> but the idea that there's, there's this opportunity in our communities where someone can say, repeat after me, touch your neighbor and say, and everyone does it like on cue. What if he said, all right, now take an orange. <laughs> Um, I would uh, just thank Laura for, I thought that was a, a great articulation of intersectionality um, and mention again that of course uh, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw gives us the term intersectionality, gives us this theoretical framework, um, she writes of mapping the margins, but um, the kind of call for an intersectional approach, um, so not to just, but is, uh, is a lengthy one, right? So Anna Julie Cooper, who our center is named after, writes in 1892, only the black woman can say when and where I enter, then and there the whole race enters with me. Which is to say that you cannot say that our nation is progressing on a set of issues unless you are looking not only at women, but women of color. Or not only at black citizens, but black citizens who are women as well. And of course, we would now add on a series of other identities as well, um, not to think of additive oppression, but again, to think intersectionally to see what is really going on, right? Um, to answer your question, which I, I really appreciate about that everything that we we're talking about is always lived out on the bodies of real people. And that is very important to, to be centered in all the, the work that is happening and to kind of put it in conversation with your question about what is the, what can universities be doing? Um, you know, I think that there are many answers. I don't have good ones, but the one I would say is um, to think very seriously about 
the relationships between universities and communities that they are part of. Um, we talk a lot about community engagement within a kind of student context, right? So are we sending students out to paint fences in the neighborhood? Great. Do the community members like the fences when they're painted? Cool. Thumbs up for community engagement. Uh, but research is, is probably the most predominant space where community engagement happens at academic institutions. Um, and I, it, health is uh, probably one of the disciplines where we see this happening most frequently. So, you know, are we building real sustainable relationships between communities and universities? Again, universities being part of the community. Um, are we asking community members about the work that we are doing before we start research studies, right? Are we taking advantage, relying on, building on community knowledge and community expertise? Are we thinking about how that research then is given back to communities? Is it going to be put in a paywall journal where we ask community members to participate in studies that they will never find the results from, right? Is it going to be relevant to them and useful? Are they gonna be able to pick it up and do something with it? Um, so to really think seriously about those being actual relationships that matter um, and that research is a space that it's really important to focus on. And Amy, I think uh, all the main points have been made and I need to get my time to put audience for questions. Great, thank you. Uh, questions from the audience? Can I add one thing to what Jennifer Singh was saying yes. about this piece on intersectionality? <coughs> I think that actually there's another element that kind of emerged out of the previous panel that emphasized medical expansion, where we can see the ways in which young men are really being left out in the states without Medicaid expansion in these ways that are patterned. And that, um, and that when we're talking about HIV, um, this is an urgent group that is left out in this, um, these kind of coverage gaps that um, sometimes we don't pay attention to intersectionality. I mean, obviously intersectionality means things like race and gender, but it can mean things like men's, right? Um, and that, this, that that's kind of an important piece. Um, for understanding what our interventions might look like if we said, okay, we want, like Medicaid expansion is essential to reducing HIV um, in the South, right? As well as reducing poverty is essential for reducing HIV, reducing segregation. You know, like putting <coughs> it on all of those frames, I think is important. Thank you. <coughs> Can I jump in really quickly on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think intersection, like, all of our bodies are race and gender. Yeah. So, um, it is important to study what's going on with cisgender heterosexual white men, but not because that is the default, because we're not asking the question. Um, you know, I think that uh, Jonathan's research, Jonathan Metzl's research, um, is a great example of what that looks like, right? To ask these questions, what is going on with white men? Um, but it has to be a question from an intersectional framework, not a default. Mm -hmm. Jonathan? I had a question for uh, Dr. Gonzalez, uh, which is, um, you know, what do you think about the critique you hear sometimes that it's, it's different to be a map changer for something like gay marriage than it is for women's <coughs> matter or gun policy or things like that? It seems it seems like that makes some assumptions about race and class and other factors. It seems like you were kind of troubling that by saying actually there's nuance. But I'm just wondering what you what you think of when you hear that that, that critique. Which is sort of <laughs> I, uh, yeah, so some of these issues are extremely nuanced and um, very difficult and very difficult to change. Um, but I think that when researchers and policy makers and community advocates all get involved and engaged, um, um, these very, these things that we, these policies that we never thought we would see in our lives can, can happen. And I'm not, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but well, that, those are my thoughts. Yeah, it's, uh, Mark Solomon, who wrote Saving Marriage, is a, is a good friend of mine. And um, we kind of had this argument because, um, you know, his point was marriage equality took off in a particular way because many Republican senators and things like that had, you know, gay relatives or mm -hmm. things like that. So in a way, I don't, I, I don't think that's a very mm -hmm. intersectional argument for why marriage equity body passed, and so I, I really appreciated that you know how you were kind of taking race and class into into account in terms of the broader implications of marriage and body. It seems to me like that point might have been oversimplified. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I only had ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> one time, uh, time for one more question. 
Yeah, so I guess my question is a blend of the rights and Dr. Gonzalez as well. So I like your part about change, recreating the story and how to do that. So if I would put that with LGBT young people, with their parents, and the parents will say, we just don't do that, that's not in our family. How can that work to change the narrative and rewrite the story? Even to bring in the church, where the church really says, you don't do that in our church versus we. How can that story be changed? So, we we actually, um, I, you know, I'm just gonna plug my book. Like, <laughs> just, just follow me on Twitter. Um, but um, it's a it's an interesting thought. And here's here's the challenge. And I, I only hesitate because it's so radical that I'd rather you read it than I say it. But <laughs> create a new community. So as you already, I'm sure you already know, what happens in these situations is we have to go and find another community, a supportive community. I'm saying take it another step further and recreate that mental community and that mental support. That's not easy. And, it, and it's done typically with the support of maybe another person and often, I think, effectively with a, a health professional, a mental health professional. But the, the real challenge is the obligation, and this is what I talk about in my book, uh, the, the parental obligation in particular and the community obligation. We feel that we have to define ourselves within that community instead of saying, no, that's, that's not required. You can start outside, it, and if you can define another community, that would work just as well, potentially. Thank you. Well, Thanks so much to all of our presenters and our respondents for an Great, we will take a four minute break. Four minutes. So and then I will get I've been doing four minutes. I introduce myself at the time. It's a hit of a resonated me with it.